No more, no more shall I. In 1963, a century after the Emancipation Proclamation, the United States was still a nation divided. Segregation kept blacks and whites in separate worlds which were anything but equal. It would take the courage and sacrifice of the young and innocent to shock a nation that believed itself the bastion of democracy into truly making America a place with liberty and justice for all. The time had come to say, no more. No more. No more. No more. In 1954, the ruling of the Supreme Court in Brown v. Board of Education declared that separate was inherently unequal and that integration ought to proceed with all deliberate speed. Not everyone agreed. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. In Birmingham, Alabama, desegregation was a dangerous business, no matter what the courts said. With more than 20 unsolved bombings between 1957 and 1963, and KKK associates in positions of power, Birmingham was a stronghold of racial oppression and intimidation. After his setback in Albany, Georgia, Martin Luther King arrived in Birmingham on April 3, 1963 for a make-or-break battle of the dying civil rights movement. Project C got off to a disappointing start. A court injunction against parading and an 800% increase in bail costs made a trip to jail more likely to last six months than six days. Marchers realistically feared losing their jobs and their homes. Few volunteered. Fewer were arrested. On April 12th, King tried to draw people by marching himself. He and Ralph Abernathy went to jail. In King's absence, jive-talking James Bevel held the floor at the mass meetings and struck a chord with the young people who didn't have jobs or own homes. They began to volunteer in droves. Bevel started a whisper campaign for student demonstrations. When King was released on April 20th, he was highly conflicted over the use of children as marchers. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, however, summed up the situation when he said, We gotta use what we got. Black parents tried to shield their children from the harsh reality of segregation, but it wasn't always possible. March of 63, they uh, blew up the church next to the house. My father's car was set on fire. He was also ran off the bridge one night. It was tough. One of the worst nights of Chris McNair's life was when he had to tell his daughter the reason he couldn't buy her the sandwich she'd wanted at a store that day was that she was black. Still, they hoped. When Barbara Cross and her family moved to Birmingham in 1962, her father, Reverend John Cross, tried to get into a taxi. And he said, we don't carry your kind. My father told him, before I leave Alabama, to be carrying anyone who wants to catch a cab. Civil rights photographer Charles Moore remembers his father saying, Son, you don't treat people poorly because they are a different color. Other white children were not so lucky. Spoon-fed hatred and lies of black inferiority and prevented by segregation from befriending black children, many believed what they'd been taught. White student Charles Entrican pointed out that people breathe in the prejudices of their culture without any understanding of what they're taking in. It takes something to wake them up. The children of Birmingham were about to wake up the entire nation. On May 2nd, DJ Shelley the Playboy announced, Kids, there's gonna be a party at the park. It was a signal. Black students of all ages climbed out classroom windows and over fences. They called it Day Day for the demonstration day at 12 o'clock noon. I know we were all leaving school. Some children walked as much as 18 miles to congregate at the 16th Street Baptist Church, site of mass meetings and nonviolent training for the movement. They would face the police they'd been taught to fear. At 1 p.m., James Bevel began sending them out in groups of 50 towards City Hall. We were the first group out of the church. We got about four or five blocks and we were stopped by the police. Bull Connor came up and uh, they put those doors over in the car. And when they stopped us, I mean the fear. Bull Connor and the police were waiting and herded the children into paddy wagons and off to jail. After an hour, they had to commandeer school buses. 973 children were arrested. On their best day, the adult demonstrators had managed 32. Went to jail, they nine days, like there the jail was horrible. 
Cells meant for 50 now held as many as 300 children. Officers beat bodies back from the door with a chain in order to open it far enough to admit more prisoners. While D-Day had yielded many arrests, the events of the day were fairly non-violent. That would not be true of double D-Day. Once again, students came by the thousands. This time, policemen were waiting with German shepherds and fire hoses. For an hour, students were quietly arrested. But Connor was running out of jail cells. He needed to scare them into stopping. Firemen doubled the water pressure to 100 pounds per square inch. Bull Connor gave the word to let him have it. The water literally blew children off their feet and swept them down the sidewalks. Witnessing this, black millionaire A.G. Gaston interrupted his phone conversation saying, I can't talk. My people are out there fighting for their lives and my freedom. I have to help them. Carolyn Mall and two other students took shelter against the wall of a nearby building. The water tore her sweater and ripped hair from her scalp. Charles Moore was there to capture the events on film. The water had scattered the students, but as the noise died down, a small group of students still standing could be heard singing, Freedom. The students regrouped. Police dogs were set on the marchers and even some of the bystanders. Spectators, demonstrators, firemen, and policemen were sent to the hospital. 1,922 children were sent to jail, but the jail was full. They filled the jail yard and were taken to the fairgrounds and locked in the stock pens. Most would stay for one to two weeks. Wherever they were in prison, the songs of the movement rang out and gave them courage. The effects of the Children's March came quickly, beginning on Miracle Sunday, when parents and children marched together. In spite of Connor's order, the firemen refused to attack. More than 20,000 students had skipped school to go to jail. By May 10th, the businesses of Birmingham had had enough and agreed to desegregate. As children returned to school, however, they were informed that they had been expelled. The school board's decision was appealed all the way to the district court in Atlanta before it was overturned and the students were readmitted. On May 17th, Life magazine published an 11-page spread of Charles Moore's photos of the Children's March. More than half the country read it. In 186 cities across the country, people marched in support of the youth of Birmingham. In the White House, the photos sickened President Kennedy, who, bolstered by the courage of the children, at last called for change. The events in Birmingham and elsewhere have so increased the cry for equality that I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. On July 23rd, Birmingham repealed its segregation ordinances, and in August, the March on Washington showed the movement was national. That fall, the schools of Birmingham were integrated, but after all these successes, the children would be asked to make one more sacrifice. On the morning of September 15, 1963, just as the Sunday school classes were ending and youth were preparing to usher on this special youth Sunday, dynamite ripped through the 16th Street Church. I had planned to go to the bathroom with my friend, and my teacher stopped me and gave me an assignment. I saw Annie to see you in a little while. Fifteen minutes after I heard the blast, it was a horrible noise. The ground was shaking under us. Something hit me in my head, and I was screaming. And I heard all the kids screaming. Everybody running outside, crying and looking for their loved ones. Five girls in the basement women's restroom were buried under 30-inch thick pieces of the wall. Four of them died. My dad saw a gaping hole in the basement where the bricks were blown away. And then when they started digging, and after about two or three feet, they found the girls' bodies blown together. The nation was appalled. The need for change was painfully clear. There could be no more Birminghams. The tide of support for civil rights swelled, flowing into Washington and pushing the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed segregation. The next year, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 resecured rights that had been part of law, but not part of life for a century. I'd like to say to my friends, through that bloodshed, that was a down payment of freedom, that was a down payment on history. The courage and sacrifice of the children finally broke the back of the rule of fear and hatred. Their innocent hope and bravery revived a dying civil rights movement and changed the future of their world. They would be afraid no more.